Okay, this panel is entitled Rate Making Methods for Cost Recovery. We have with us today three wonderful panelists. Let me introduce them. First, uh, we've got Doug Lewin, who's the Vice President, Regulatory Affairs and Market Development for Clear Result. Ryan Katowski, Vice President, Industry Analysis, Advanced Energy Economy. And Sonia Agarwal, Vice President for Energy Innovation. Who is starting? Ms. Agarwal, go ahead, please. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really happy to be um, in my home state um, and uh, back talking about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart well, you also. Have to, you have to tell us where you're from. If this is your <laughs> um, so I'm from outside of Cleveland. Um, I grew up in Chesterland, which is in Geauga County. Um, and uh, my parents are still there. They're going to drive over this evening and say hello. Oh, so Welcome um, back. Yeah, so this is nice. This is uh, exciting for me. <laughs> um, so just a quick word about um, where I'm coming from. Um, we have a project called America's Power Plan where we brought together about 200 electricity policy experts from around the U.S. about five or six years ago now to think through um, what are kind of the fundamental fundamental institutional changes that need to um, occur in this country if we're to get out of the electric system all the innovation that is coming quickly down the pike. So um, I won't spend too much time on that, but I'll just um, jump in. First, I also wanted to just commend all of you guys for um, just this is a really forward looking process that you have undertaken here. And I'm really um, just glad to get to be a part of the conversation. And I, I really enjoyed the earlier presentations and totally agree with um, with the things that were said there. So I hope I can add a little bit of additional color. Um, <clears throat> So just a little bit of context about how the power sector has evolved um, in the last few years. So we've always had these goals of meeting growing demand, building new infrastructure, building to deliver universal service, um, and doing all of that affordably, reliably, and safely. Um, and then we had these older options around centralized power plants, transmission lines, and the distribution system. And as things have evolved, um, we now have the opportunity to be optimizing the system. We have a ton of more options to do that. Um, it's a lot about customer satisfaction now because there's a lot of um, other companies and uh, interests that are coming in with options for customers. Um, people are interested in having their power be cleaner. Um, and then we all still have to do that reliably, affordably, and safely. Um, luckily, we have lots of new options to do that, which I understand you guys heard quite a lot about in the prior phases of this effort. Um, um, and uh, a lot of interesting ways that uh, IT is hitting the electricity sector these days and um, enabling many more uh, things to occur that were no were not possible before. So this kind of broad context creates a couple of new issues, and I think that these are. Um, fundamentally some of the important issues that you guys are working through this whole process to address. Um, one of them is just um, around greater information asymmetry between the utility and regulators. So because there's all of these changes happening on the system, um, you know, uh, there is um, oftentimes um, not enough information for the public and for policymakers to really understand um, what is happening with the electricity system as it's changing faster and faster. Uh, then also, um, often with the cost of service approach, um, utilities financial incentives are not always aligned with the modern goals and driving innovation. So. As Dave mentioned earlier, um, you want to know where you are before you start going down a big path of um, moving toward performance-based regulation. Um, so before, for example, a big distribution system investment around grid modernization, um, it can be really an important step to map and analyze the current system so that you can tell where are the highest value areas for additional investment or where can you create a market mechanism 
mechanism for third parties to come in and solve some of those pain points. Um, and then also to understand the, per the potential contribution of distributed energy resources, how those resources might affect the bulk system operations, um, and, uh, and really start to just get a sense of what's going on on your distribution system so that you can start to move that forward to where you want it to go. Um, this will be uh, quite familiar, but um, again, uh, on the addressing information asymmetry piece, um, you know, a very good way to do that is to just establish goals that are um, really clearly understood by, um, by policymakers, by utilities, by other stakeholders, um, by interested customers. So that this is, this is kind of around what Dave was talking about earlier, um, the outcomes. So we like to think about outcome-oriented performance-based regulation, outcome-oriented metrics. So once you get um, specific about the broad goals, then trying to go deeper into what, what are the metrics that utilities can work to to meet those broad goals. So this is more of the outputs that Dave was talking about earlier. And I just pulled this, bless you, I just pulled this um, uh, table from the Rhode Island Commission proceeding um, that Doug also mentioned um, earlier, uh, where they've kind of taken this broad goal of system efficiency and broken it down into very specific um, uh, outputs that they um, see as building up to an efficient system. Um, they've clearly laid out the purpose of the metric and then um, they've uh, made some moves in the direction of a uh, formula or trying to get specific on what the, that metric itself should be. Um, then the idea of making all of this stuff public early, um, I think, has been proven in a few different areas. Um, this is an example from Ontario, where they have uh, published the performance of their utilities um, on an ongoing basis. And this just brings a lot more transparency to, um, to the utility performance. And even if you don't, uh, before you go the step of adding the financial incentives, it's just really helpful for um, folks to kind of know what are the broad goals? What are those metrics that add up to those goals? And then um, how are the utilities performing from the baseline level? So this is all kind of about um, understanding where you are now um, before moving toward aligning financial incentives toward meeting performance objectives. So this is a piece that came out from America's Power Plan by a former commissioner from Colorado. Um, and it's just, a, I think, a really nice way of summarizing why uh, to think about about performance-based regulation, um, and it's about changing that central question in uh, utility um, rate making from did we pay the right amount for what we got, which is kind of the review of um, are these expenses prudent, um, to a forward-looking question that's are we paying maybe the right amount for, for what we want. And that is all about looking at where the utility is now and where you want, want the electric system to be in the future. Um, so we have this uh, short report on getting the most out of grid modernization. Um, and so I thought I would offer just a couple of things from that report um, because uh, there are a few other options for you guys to consider as you're thinking about how, um, to Commissioner Trumbold's question earlier, how do you start to layer on the performance incentives and, and where to start? What are the options? So um, here on, if you take, you know, there's a lot of interest around the whole country right now in um, investments by utilities in grid modernization plans and grid modernization efforts. Um, so you could look at the um, uh, plan for grid modernization that a uh, utility might be coming forward with. And again, it's a good idea to start with mapping where, where we are now before um, making any judgments on the plan. Um, but then uh, if there's a budget associated with um, you know, making uh, improvements to the distribution system, um, you could make uh, performance a condition for earning the rate of return on that um, 
on that budget for the grid modernization plan. So even if it's not the overall system, there's, there's kind of an interim option there. So as you're considering grid modernization investments, um, that could be an interesting kind of first layer of performance-based regulation to move toward. Um, also, <clears throat> Uh, as, as opposed to just making it a condition, you could also have a scale on the rate of return based on the performance on uh, some important outcomes. Um, and then sort of in a similar way to um, uh, the overall uh, revenue cap that's used in the Rio uh, performance-based regulatory regime in the UK, um, there could be a budget cap for the grid modernization portion of investments with some shared savings mechanisms between utilities and consumers. So these are just some ideas that kind of take the overall performance-based regulation concept and apply it to something that, um, you know, uh, many utilities around the U.S. Are, are really thinking about doing now. And, and the reason that you would want to do this is um, I think there's been a lot of experience with um, utilities wanting to um, make investments in smart meters, for example. <laughs> and then they'll roll out a lot of smart meters and um, maybe use them for remote meter reading or something like that. But there's a huge amount of value that you can get out of a smart meter, which has to do with you know understanding when your distribution system system peaks are in different parts of the distribution system, seeing if there may be other um, alternatives to um, traditional substation upgrades or something like that, where you could create a market mechanism, for example, and allow third parties to come in to provide distributed energy resources or other things to um, address those distribution system needs. All that data from smart meters could be used for that type of thing, but right now, um, under a you know, sort of traditional cost of service based regulatory regime, there's not really a financial incentive for utilities to use that data in that way. So that's just an example of, you know, why you would want to think about trying to come up with outcomes for specifically a grid modernization um, plan as well. So just to recap super fast, um, this was all about ways to address information asymmetry, which might be arising from lots of innovation, hitting the distribution system and hitting the electricity system in general, um, getting specific and quantitative about what your goals are early on makes a lot of sense, mapping the system, understanding where, the, those, um, where those opportunities are for either the utility to provide um, alternative approaches to meeting these outcomes or for market mechanisms to be created that are clear that people can participate in to uh, provide those um, and making making all that public um, and then aligning incentives um, quite along the lines of what's in that great wrap report that you guys um, uh, have co-created um, and then also um, thinking about additional ways that you could start to move toward that uh, financial alignment. So that is all. I'll leave you with that. Um, and happy to take questions now or after um, after we go through the other presentations. Thank you. We'll go through all the presentations okay. and then do Q&A. Thank Great. you very Thank much. Thank you, guys. OK. Doug, you're next. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, commissioners and uh, staff of the commission. Um, you know, just before uh, I get started, I do just want to echo Sonia's comments on the um, importance of what you guys are doing here. As somebody that works in regulatory across 40 states and provinces, the record you're creating here is really important that we can point other commissions to to say, look at what's there and build on that and move things forward. So thank you very much uh, and thank you for having me. I'm Doug Lewin. I head up regulatory affairs for uh, clear result. Um, just a couple of things real quick um, about clear. I have a clicker here, don't I? There we go. Um, we, we do, as I mentioned, work across 40 states and provinces uh, throughout uh, North America. Uh, we work for over 200 utilities, um, deliver significant energy savings and, and services and value for the utilities we work with and their, and their end use customers. Um, we also, you know, try to uh, be part of things like this and contribute to thought leadership and, and moving the ball uh, forward. Um, 
the great uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist, once said, if you, if you can't explain what you do to uh, a grade school um, child, then you don't really understand it. Um, I had the, uh, the, the privilege and the challenge of explaining what a, uh, a vice president of regulatory affairs for an energy efficiency company uh, means to my son's uh, class at career day a week or two ago, um, which was quite the challenge. But you know, the way I put it was I said, look, uh, how many of you in here want to own a business one day? And many of them raised their hands. And I said, what if I came to you and I said, hey, I've got this great service to offer you. I'm going to help you sell less of your product to your customers. Would you be excited to buy that service? And they all said, no. I said, well, so this is what I do. I work with our clients to try to help make it not just palatable or okay, but actually exciting and motivating for utilities to offer these services to, to their customers. So that's what we described in a couple different white papers we wrote, one called Lower Spending, Higher Returns, um, which I think the title is very suggestive, right, of what that does. I think um, Doug was referring uh, earlier to in Rhode Island how they've really focused on overall system costs as a key performance metric. That's one of the ways you can go. Um, I'll get in this presentation. I'll talk about how some states have, have uh, worked to solve that problem. The second white paper we did was called uh, Creating Customer and Investor Value Through Energy Efficiency. So a lot of what Sonia was talking about, this aligning incentives. The customer um, you know, wants to save money on their electric bill. They want to be more energy efficient. They want to have increased comfort in their homes, increased control over their energy bills, and even control over the things within their house, their thermostats, their lights, all these kinds of things. Um, how can we align the financial interests uh, of the utilities um, with those goals of customers? So, you know, there's, we, we live, this, this, this next quote I just sort of put out there to kind of tee this up. Thomas Friedman in his book, Thank You for Being Late, talks a lot about the age of acceleration we're in, right? How technology is accelerating. Everybody's familiar with Moore's Law that computing power, you know, doubles uh, every 18 to 24 months. And I love this quote, right? Government regulators need to be as innovative as the innovators. They need to operate at the speed of Moore's Law. And you know, I think what he means by that is really that as the technologies evolve, there has to be a way for customers to be able to get a hold of these technologies. So I really want to you know, just emphasize, and obviously what we're talking about here today and what you guys have been talking about for weeks through Power Forward is how to bring that regulatory innovation forward. And I would argue that one of the places where it's needed the most is in energy efficiency. Ohio is very much a leader in energy efficiency. Uh, there's energy efficiency going on all, obviously all over the country to, to various degrees. This is a, a chart that actually is based on uh, national data. It's from EPRI, who you heard from on cybersecurity yesterday, a very trusted source. Um, every three, four, five years, something like that, they do a, a, a study of potential of energy efficiency. And I want to be real clear for, for everybody here, this is not technical uh, potential. This is not when you hear like, a couple of square miles in the Mojave could like power the whole country with solar. It's like, okay, that's true, but how are you going to get it out to people? This is not about technical potential of energy efficiency. It's not even about economic. It's not just what an economist would tell you makes sense. This is what's called achievable potential, and that means what when you actually factor in the most difficult part of the equation, the human factor, which is, of course, it makes economic sense to put insulation in your, in your roof or to put a smart thermostat on your wall or to change out your light bulbs or whatever it might be, but customers have com obviously competing interests for that capital, whether they be a residential customer, a, a small commercial customer, all the way up to the largest of the large. They have different demands on that capital, right? So this takes into account even those barriers, things like split incentives when you have a different owner versus the tenant, all those sorts of things, even when you factor all those in, there is a massive amount of energy efficiency that we aren't getting close to achieving in, in this country as a whole. So when we say energy efficiency, what do we mean? There's the tried and true, there's lighting, insulation, and HVAC. This is the bread and butter of the programs, and, and it continues to be but the definition is expanding. Um, you know, smart thermostats have become very common in energy efficiency programs. They help not only with energy efficiency, but also with demand reductions and system optimization. We're doing a lot of that through our programs with our partners. Um, solar is even coming into it, either incentivizing it, uh, distributed, or doing things like community solar. Of course, electric vehicles, everybody's talking about that now, and, and incentivizing charging so that, it can, so that smart charging can happen. Battery storage, we, we have um, some utilities now that are actually incentivizing storage. Uh, and then, of course, that customer empowerment piece, giving customers the tools to actually control that to the extent they want it, to automate it if they don't want to think about it. 
um, but to actually have some power over their uh, bills. And this, you know, I think really kind of gets to the, to the main point is that energy efficiency is often, there's sort of a synonym for it that's demand side management. And I think that's actually a better way to think about it. You know, how do we control and, and move around the demand side, right? For the longest period of time, for, the, for basically most, uh, for all of the 100 years of the utility industry, 100 plus years, we've always built supply to be above demand, right? It was always whatever demand is, the peak demand at that, that, that top day, plus 12% or 15% or 17% or whatever that state wanted. Now with the onset of renewables, and of course this is happening at different speeds in different places, we're actually seeing a great need for demand to actually follow supply. Now does that mean that a customer has to sit there on their phone and move it? Of course not. Through things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can optimize homes and businesses to actually provide that load following. But again, what, it, what would be the incentive for utilities to actually uh, go in that direction? So this is, and, and Christine, if you don't mind, I'll need to update this with, with the right credit. The credit for this should go to uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, this is a, a chart that they put out uh, in a report on performance-based rate, rate making and talked about traditional cost of service really being focused on the commodity and asset, right? How much of uh, concrete and steel do you put in the ground to earn a rate of return on and how much throughput, now to what Dave Littell was talking about earlier, that throughput incentive, how much of the commodity are you actually selling? As throughout the last couple of decades, there have been additional rate making variants. I won't get into these in detail because you heard a lot of it from Dave. Lost revenue adjustments, decoupling, performance incentives, all these kinds of things are rate making variants that allow utilities to move more towards providing value and services uh, to their customers. And the evolution, right? I mean, the, the two things that are on the left, getting a bill, you know, having a call center to call into, these things obviously have existed for a very long time. But as we see, you know, this, this transformation in the utility industry happening, uh, utilities are more proactively providing information to their customers about their usage, things like usage alerts and that. But now it's getting even more um, sophisticated and targeted so that we can really understand there are some customers that are just leave me alone, I don't want any of it. There's other customers that really want to be involved. They want to be able to reduce their energy. They want clean energy. There, there's a lot of different types of customers and utilities are much, much better able now and, but there's still a long way to go to actually offer the services that customers want. Uh, and, the, and the sort of you know, additional evolution that's in the process of happening is that becoming that trusted energy advisor to their customers and helping them understand how they can control their usage um, and reduce their bills and things like that. So I, I love this quote, the, the, the Innovator's Dilemma, the classic book by Clayton Christensen. Um, he has this quote that markets that don't exist can't be analyzed. Suppliers and customers uh, must discover them together. Some of the markets that are being created right now in the utility world are really around the demand side. And I think it's really critical that when we think of grid modernization, we don't think only of the grid as the things that are, you know, substations and poles and wires and things like that, but to think of homes and businesses as nodes on the grid. Um, and this, this quote from the Edison Foundation, the Institute for Electric Innovation, which does uh, some great work, grid modernization provides a platform to individualize energy services for customers and to offer solutions. And you know, when you see, I, I won't go through each of them, but you see all the little icons there of all the things on the demand side that could be contributing to increased reliability, resiliency. You've heard a lot of talk today about system efficiency. This is one of the greatest ways to get beyond that 55% you know, capacity factor that is the norm in the, in the United States. I love the, the, the you know, great, uh, what's one of the few like jokes that I like in this industry is that, you know, you, you, do you see a glass half full or half empty? I see a glass at half capacity factor, right? We, 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 didn't, we didn't size the glass right, right? So how do we get to actually, you know, improve that capacity factor? The demand side needs to be a huge part of that. And I, I, I love this, uh, you know, headline from uh, Utility Dive. I'm sure everybody in this crowd reads Utility Dive and Green Tech Media and the like. They've covered this sort of thing quite a bit. But, you know, it's kind of tongue in cheek. Alexa, please balance the distribution grid. And it's like, okay, that's kind of silly. But within a few years with machine learning and AI, and again, with that Moore's Law and this age of accelerations we live in, it is absolutely possible for the demand side to be moved uh, in an automated way to increase system efficiency and lower costs for all, while also bringing additional control to customers who want it. The, the um, chart on the left, is, of course, is, 
you know, sort of one of the, the, the many representations of the, of the duck curve, essentially. As solar ramps up, you know, a big sort of belly in the middle of the day, and then a big peak. So can you actually have, through thermostats like Ecobee and Nest and others, actually a pre-cooling during that period so that you don't have to use as much and you're actually sort of smoothing that out? Again, increasing uh, system efficiency. So how do we get there? What are, what are the models that will support uh, this kind of vision? So there's really, as I see it, three main models. Forgive me, I get thirsty when I talk real fast. Uh, there's three main models. Um, one of them, the most common, is the one on the left, which is some form of decoupling, right? Again, you heard a lot about this. Is the, the previous uh, presentations have teed this up real well, so I don't need to go into great detail on this. It takes many forms, lost revenue adjustment mechanisms, lost contribution to fixed costs, so on and so forth, or decoupling. But some form of that, plus a performance incentive, again, to that point of how I described it to, to, to grade schoolers, why would a utility want to send so would, to sell less of their product? There needs to be some kind of an incentive mechanism there. 26 or so states now have, including Ohio, of course, have some form um, of performance incentive mechanism. Um, the middle one, and I'll go into a few specific state uh, examples in a minute, are rate-based uh, models of energy efficiency. As far as I know, there are five states that are doing this right now. That definitely removes that disincentive. It puts the, the decision squarely on an equal playing field. Should we put more in, in, you know, um, uh, investment into infrastructure, or should we put it on the demand side? If there's an ROE on that demand side, it makes that um, equal. And then one that is very much still sort of uh, taking shape as, uh, as uh, the ComEd executives, um, Ann Promajori and Val Jensen describe it, uh, this platform thing is kind of impressionism. We can see the forms, but we can't quite make out the specifics yet. I love that way of putting it. Um, New York is, is working on this a lot, as are some other states, uh, Illinois and some others, trying to figure out how the utilities can actually bring other third parties into the system and incentivize that behavior. So again, it's to some of the previous speakers, what should the utility be doing? What should some others be doing? And if you think others should be doing it, how do you, how do you provide a motivation, again, to that quote of all regulations, incentive regulation, how do you give an incentive to utilities to sort of open up the grid as a platform and say, come on in here and, and serve customers? So I have, and I know I'm, I, I want to leave plenty of time for Ryan and for questions, so I'll go through these really quickly. I just have four examples of, of states where this is happening to give you some concrete examples. And then Ryan is going to, you know, really get into some of the details of, of how the math works for utilities um, on this. So I'll, I'll, I won't do that. I'll, I'll make a handoff there for that part. But Maryland uh, is one of those states that allows for rate basing of energy efficiency. Um, they also allow for DR savings to, to the benefits from that that are put into the PJM market to be shared uh, with customers in a, in a shared benefit uh, sort of a way. So Maryland is a very interesting model, and, and the utilities there are very motivated to provide more um, uh, services to their customers. As was mentioned earlier, the, the, some of the peak time rebates they do and all that are very popular there. Um, I think the, the, the numbers I've seen are that something like just about 50% of customers um, I can't remember this BG&E or Pepco's area. I think it's BG&E. Somewhere around 40, 50 percent of their customers have used the programs in some way, which is uh, incredibly high. And of course, even for those that don't use it, because overall costs are going down, everybody benefits to the tune of two dollars for every one spent. Uh, Michigan, um, all Republican legislature, Republican governor, increased their performance incentives in the 2016 uh, legislative session uh, to give additional, I'm sorry, I just added the word benefits there on the bottom. That was a typo. I'll try to fix that when I send it in two. But uh, the basic point there is same kind of thing, right? They, they have taken more of that performance incentive mechanism only. And, and part of the, the reason to show different, you know, varieties of this is that this can vary widely by state and there's not like, you know, the way this state does it is exactly the right way to do it. There's many different ways to do it, but, in, but providing some incentive to utilities to do more energy efficiency, to do more energy efficiency programs is very important. Um, so Michigan increased their performance incentives um, and all of the utilities have, there have been increasing their uh, programs since that legislation was passed. Utah took a very different uh, approach. They did rate-based energy efficiency. They did it for a very specific reason. Uh, there was a coal plant that due to both environmental regulations and economics needed to come off. 
So they accelerated the depreciation on that. Um, and replaced it with an energy efficiency asset. So again, now when uh, Rocky Mountain Power, the biggest utility there, makes investment decisions, energy efficiency is on an equal playing field uh, with uh, plant. Uh, and Illinois, which has been brought up earlier, but I think this one's really interesting because as far as I know, they're the only state to, to do this so far. Not only did they allow a, a return on equity uh, for uh, energy efficiency, but if the utility goes 25% above their minimum goal, they actually can earn up to 200 basis points additional uh, on their uh, return on equity. Uh, and I would just leave you with this. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. This is happening in so many different ways from Hawaii to, to New York. Ontario is doing interesting, everything in between. And I think what you're doing here is just the right thing, exploring these things and trying to find concrete steps to move towards that, that goal of aligning customers' interests with the financial interest of the utilities uh, so that customers benefit and overall costs go down. Uh, there's my contact information in case uh, you want to reach me afterwards and where those papers are. And I thank you for your attention and the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Doug. Doug's also familiar to the agency. Who knew you were so entertaining, Doug? I mean, this was, was, that entertaining? It was I thought it was so very entertaining. Yeah, thank good. you. Ryan, you're up. <laughs> Now, you don't have to be entertaining, Ryan. Oh. All right. <laughs> we'll, find, we'll find out, I guess. Yeah, right. um, I, I'm, I'm disturbed by that, that um, explaining your job to uh, grade schools because I, I still, still can't do it. So, um, so um, I'll add my thanks uh, for the opportunity to be here and to contribute to what you're doing um, here in Ohio. We're, we've been following this all along, and we're very excited to see where, where you take this uh, in the coming months. So I'm going to talk about uh, a particular opportunity for utilities around service-based solutions. Uh, we've been talking a lot about performance-based regulation, uh, aligning incentives, and uh, we undertook a study uh, to look specifically at that for, for some, some particular opportunities. Um, so this, this slide kind of encapsulates everything we've been talking about this morning. Uh, we know that the model uh, uh, for utilities is changing. Uh, going from a, a, a return on capital to, uh, to performance, uh, and also this particular issue that I'm going to focus on, this idea of uh, procuring services in lieu of utilities making capital investments and finding ways for utilities to be uh, incentivized to pursue those services where it makes sense. So if you think about the, the performance-related uh, issues, those are primarily focused on uh, earning uh, based on outputs, this concept of procuring services is just another, it's another form of input to the utility if you want to look at it that way. And the question is how can you, how can you put those on the same, uh, on a level playing field with uh, traditional capital investments? And I'll just add that for the most part, uh, we see all of these emerging opportunities, at least for now, building on, but not necessarily fully replacing a cost of service model. Uh, eventually you may get to a more, a more um, uh, sort of foundational change to, to, the, to the basis of regulation, but at least in the near term, that's what we, that's what we see happening. So here are just some examples um, of uh, services that are increasingly uh, being available to replace capital. Uh, information technology is the most obvious one. Instead of utilities investing in servers, software, and IT infrastructure, they can just go to the cloud. Uh, we know that uh, NARUC has a resolution on uh, the regulatory treatment of cloud computing. Uh, encouraging commissions to look at how they can do that. Uh, Illinois has an active rulemaking on this as we speak. Uh, so this is definitely one particular area where the service solution provides numerous advantages to the utility, but the utilities often, um, their incentive is still to deploy capital. So looking how to, how to balance that, how to, e how to equalize those is, is uh, particularly uh, relevant today. Uh, on transmission distribution infrastructure, uh, doing demand management, uh, getting dispatch rights on distributed resources or doing non-wires projects. Those are all service-oriented solutions to traditional investments. And for utilities that are in the supply business, instead of owning their own generation, they can uh, sign PPAs or they can do demand management. So these are just some examples of how uh, service solutions can be viable alternatives to traditional uh, utility capital investments. So uh, when we looked at this issue, uh, we, um, we found a a lack of, uh, I'll say, quantitative analysis on this, and we uh, uh, decided to do something about it. Uh, our sister organization, Advanced Energy Economy Institute, uh, issued a study, came out earlier this year, 
Uh, would have come out last year, but we, uh, we redid all the calculations after the new tax law change because it had some in important implications for the analysis. So um, my colleague, Danny Wagner, who's with us, uh, uh, I'll, I'll mix, mix metaphors, uh, he, he um, burned, the, burned the midnight oil at both ends, um, getting, uh, getting our uh, analysis up to date uh, for the new tax law. So what we did is we, um, we developed a uh, detailed utility financial model that explored two types of service solutions. One was cloud computing and one was the, uh, the non-wires alternatives or NWAs as they're referred to sometimes. And our, our goal with this was to really explore what regulatory options are out there to help uh, uh, level the playing field between the, uh, the service option and the capital option. Um, but that could also align those interests, so that, that proverbial win-win. Can you, can you do what's good for the customer and do what's good for the utility at the same time? Uh, important caveats about the analysis. Uh, it's, it's a, if, if you've had a chance to look at the paper, as I think some of you might have, it's a fairly detailed uh, uh, analysis. It's not a light read, I will admit that. Uh, but um, we wanted to make sure that we were transparent with our assumptions and our approach to this. We did not assume that services solutions are better or lower cost than capital. That was not a going assumption into the, into the analysis. We did not look at these uh, options from the bottom up and try to understand the relative benefits. But we wanted to say that if you had these two solutions, um, how would you how would you look at them from a regulatory treatment standpoint to, to, to incentivize utilities to make decisions that would be, to be those win-wins? Um, importantly, uh, the, the options that we developed and analyzed don't require changes to uh, current utility accounting rules. So you don't need, you don't need big changes uh, from that side to, to actually make these things happen. So we started off by defining two uh, sort of, we call them status quo or reference options. One is the traditional capital solution. So the utility purchases assets and operates them and they get their cost recovery as they would on, uh, on others, other investments. Uh, the other one is to treat uh, the service purely as an O&M expense, again, within that existing context. So these are generally uh, passed through uh, pass through costs to customers where utilities are not earning uh, earning uh, returns on them. We wanted to we wanted to have that in there so that we could compare that to other service based options. So these are essentially the status quo options that we that we use as reference for looking at the uh, additional options. We defined five uh, regulatory options, and I'll walk through these quickly uh, in the interest of time. Uh, the first one we call the DER adder. This is actually a pilot that was proposed in California. The idea is to essentially uh, allow the utility to uh, earn uh, uh, what, we, what you might call a markup on a, uh, on a qualified service expense. So if it's got a, uh, if it's got a NWA uh, with a particular cost, they basically earn a 4% uh, markup on, the, um, on what they pay uh, for that service. Uh, the second one is uh, what we call a prepaid contract. So this is where you might have, let's say, a cloud computing uh, services contract. The utility fully prepays for that and uh, puts that prepayment into uh, its rate base as a regulatory asset and earns on that as it would on a capital investment. Uh, the next one is we call NWA shared savings. So this um, is structured like the prepaid contract but the utility also receives 30% uh, of any net cost savings compared to the traditional uh, capital alternative. So we, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of our modeling assumptions, but the idea here is that if the, if the service does provide uh, lower costs, then the utility gets to share in that uh, at 30%. Uh, the next one, uh, which is probably the most complicated to describe, is called the modified clawback mechanism. This is the idea where if a utility has a multi-year rate plan and they avoid a capital investment because they've procured a service instead. Um, normally, the earnings, uh, all the revenue and earnings associated with that unspent capital would be clawed back at the next rate case. The idea here is to allow the utility to retain all those savings during that current rate period. So for, if the rate cases occur every three years, um, if there's any savings to be had by procuring the service over the capital, the utility gets to keep that until the next rate case. The last option was an option that we developed called pay as you go. Um, the idea here, rather than do a prepaid contract, you pay for the service 
annually and it build the it, it goes into the rate base over time so the regulatory asset builds over time so the advantage of that one say compared to prepaid is that you have more flexibility so one of the beauties of cloud computing is that you can you can procure more of it or less of it as you need it but if you've prepaid for that service um, you don't have that flexibility. So it's a, it's a similar concept, but giving a bit more flexibility. And with the exception of that one, all of these other ones are being done to varying degrees uh, in, in different states. So now that I've thoroughly confused you with that, um, the, um, the model that we built um, tested all of these options in um, uh, three deployment scenarios, and I'll define those in a minute. Um, and two cost cases, and the, the cost cases were meant to really test this, the shared savings component uh, uh, of the analysis. So we have an equivalent cost case where the, essentially the, the, the capital investment and the, the net present cost of the service solution are the same. So, you're, so, you're, so you're, you're setting those level to each other going into the analysis, and then we can see what the differences are. Uh, and then the, the second cost case looks at the assumption, well, if the service is um, 25% cheaper, how does that change the analysis? And again, that was primarily to look at the impact of shared savings. So we've got, we've got seven regulatory uh, models, two are the status quo, five are the, the new ones. We've got these two different cost cases and we've got these three different deployment scenarios. One is a short-term replacement, so a five-year uh, replacement. So this would be uh, it, you know, uh, representative of a cloud computing solution where the utility would invest in servers and software versus buying cloud services. The second one is what we call the short-term deferral scenario. So this is where a, 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 a non-wires uh, type of a solution would defer a traditional investment by five years, but then the utility would then go ahead and make that traditional investment. And then the third option is where the service um, could actually fully replace a long-term capital investment. So this would be a sustained procurement, say, of, of uh, load reduction and other demand-side services through an NWA that would completely avoid a traditional, uh, what you might call, poles and wires investment. So lots of scenarios, cases, options. Um, I'll try to present some of the results at a high level and then um, uh, try to answer your questions as best I can. So here's a quick snapshot of the results for the short-term replacement scenario. Again, this is a sort of cloud-focused uh, uh, option. The, you see the reference case there in the lower, uh, in the lower uh, right. Uh, the x-axis is the cost to customers, and the y-axis is the, uh, the net present value to shareholders. So if you look at where that reference case is in the corner, anything that is above it and to the left represents a win-win, right? So the customer costs are lower and the NPV to shareholders is higher than in the reference case. So you can see in this short-term example, uh, the modified clawback uh, tends to increase shareholder returns quite significantly because the shareholder pockets all the savings, the utility pockets all the savings for three years, and then the customer gets it for the next, uh, you know, going forward. So, so there's an incentive for the utility to do that in those cases. You can see the difference between the equivalent cost case, which is the maroon color, versus the lower cost case, which is in the orange. And obviously, it makes sense that if a service solution is cheaper, it's going to lower customer costs. But you can see even in those cases where you've got, particularly we have the shared savings opportunities, the PAYGO option and the NWA shared savings, even though that solution is a, a lower cost solution than a traditional investment, the utility is still uh, coming out ahead. So those represent some interesting win-wins. Um, obviously, the service as O&M, which is the status quo, the utility doesn't uh, earn much on those, so uh, although it's a savings to customers, it's, it's not really uh, a benefit to the utility. So that's the short-term replacement scenario. Um, if you look at the short-term deferral scenario, it looks a little bit different. Um, the, um, here again, remember you're, you're doing a service solution for five years, but then the utility is going ahead and making a traditional investment. So. That's why the service as O&M is not down at zero or close to zero because they're still making that traditional investment just a few years later. Uh, but here again, too, there are options, uh, particularly where shared savings is involved, where you can uh, provide benefits to customers and make the utility, I would say, indifferent or slightly, uh, slightly better off than in the reference case. And again, the, the modified clawback uh, 
you know, what you're doing here is you're doing, you're doing essentially what you did in the short-term deferral case, but then still doing the traditional investment. So those look pretty favorable from a utility perspective. The last one is the long-term replacement uh, option. One of the things that's noteworthy here is there's a lot more daylight between the reference case and the, uh, and the other cases. That's actually partly due uh, to the changes, some of the changes in the tax law. Uh, that had to do with um, uh, bonus depreciation. So uh, if I'm getting this right, and Danny, you'll correct me if I'm not. There he is. Uh, what happened here was um, utilities are no longer receiving uh, bonus depreciation for certain things. So it's actually made the, you know, the, the bonus depreciation re reduces costs to customers because things come off the books quicker. So the reference case got uh, relatively more expensive, whereas the service providers are able to take advantage of, those, of, of some benefits in the tax law. So it's actually lowered, lowered the cost of the service options. So that's why you're seeing a bigger spread between the reference case and some of the service-based options. But here too, again, you see the shared savings options, which are the pay-go, and the NWA shared savings um, yield some pretty, uh, pretty measurable benefits both to the customer and to the utility. So I'll just wrap up real quick. Um, um, what we found from this work is that if service solutions are more cost effective, there are indeed options for both utilities and customers to benefit. Uh, you know, I, I think there's been some comments today uh, earlier about making sure that the utility uh, utility finances remain healthy. Uh, you know, these options show that that's possible, um, even as uh, uh, the economy continues to shift more towards services. Uh, I mentioned earlier that some of these are already in use and I think could be implemented quite readily, the notion of a prepaid contract or an NWA. Uh, other options uh, that we explored provide some some more flexibility um, might be better for some uh, to consider over the long term, such as the pay-as-you-go, DER adder, and modified clawback. And I'll just end with that last point about how regulators do have multiple options at their disposal when they want to look at this issue. And I'll stop there and um, be happy to answer your questions or have Danny do it. Thank you very much. Really nice panel. Um, let me just first of all, provide an observation. And the observation is it's really hard to get very, very deep on the we in the weeds on this issue because what has become apparent to me is is that until the until the commission outlines some objectives or outcomes for what it wants to see out of um, grid mod, it's really hard to then say, okay, so let's say it's efficiency or let's say it's providing innovation to customers or whatever it is. How would we incent that through performance based rate making? So what? So let me just throw that out there, which is this is a very inquisitive group of folks, but it's 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 actually it's challenging to get to that level of granularity with you all this morning um, because of that. But that's also been very purposeful as part of this proceeding because, you know, we're, we are, you know, we, we are learning as our educators educate us. Um, so that's just one observation to make. But the second observation actually, it, um, um, it really is a observation I think Matt Snyder made, which is the difference in 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 Ohio <laughs> with base rates and riders. Actually, rider mechanisms are um, a far easier pathway for us to manipulate than base rates. And so, with rider mechanisms, we really for each one of our distribution utilities now we will have two primary mechanisms for potential cost recovery in this space. The first is just a in between, we'll call it in between rate cases, um, capital investment um, to maintain the distribution system. Okay, so um, there's that. And then the second is we'll just call it we'll call it smart grid rider for all of our distribution utilities. And so it seems to me that once we identify some objectives, that's that we could we could there's 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 there is the possibility there to take those riders, which we look at with more frequency, and pair some potential performance-based measures to those riders. I have a very specific question, and I asked this question very inarticulately to Dave Littell, but let me ask this panel here. Let us assume that that's what we do. 
okay? And that's a process, right? We've got to Id identify the objectives, and then we've got to collectively agree upon some performance-based outcomes, um, some performance-based measures for those objectives. Is it the consensus of the body that at some point the agency is going to have to um, um, the agency is going to have to implement some kind of loss revenue approach in base rates for the distribution utilities, either straight fixed variable or decoupling, um, because that again I want I, in my mind I'm separating. You know I, I move whenever I hear these conversations I move directly to implementation in my brain. Okay, so riders one bucket. Okay, other bucket base rates, and from what we've heard today, you've got specifically the lost revenue piece, which would impact base rates. And so I'd love to hear from you about whether or not you think that is a, that is a necessary eventuality of, of, um, of all things grid mod. Can I start off with, the, with a Yogi Berra quote? Yeah. <laughs> sure. That if you don't know where you're going, you'll wind up somewhere else. <laughs> so um, I, I, I definitely agree on the, the importance of setting those goals first. I, I don't, I don't know if I would say that uh, something like revenue decoupling is absolutely necessary, but it certainly helps a lot, right? Um, so, so getting getting that as part of the package of things you're going to look at, um, it's not sufficient to achieve everything you want to achieve, but it certainly helps um, helps with other things that you might want to do, um, you know, related whether it's performance related or or uh, pursuing non-wires projects, all the kinds of things that would, uh, you know, the, the idea here uh, is, you know, is to, is to change that the, the, the underlying motivation of the utility. And, and in that sense, I think it is, it is important to, to think about uh, working that in. Good. Um, so I guess I would just add um, one uh, way that we like to think about this is um, there is a guy named Steve Keim who's out of Wisconsin, and he likes to talk about um, what do utility ma what does utility management get motivated by? Um, it's often what their sh shareholders are asking them about, and um, that that has a lot to do with the risk the return and the scale of every investment. And so part of what we're trying to get at here is if you want to have a more cost efficient system as a whole, which includes a lot of demand side resources and efficiency and all of these things, um, you are likely to be making investments at a lower scale, right? And um, so I think you know, lost revenue adjustment mechanisms or decoupling um, can be a really important way to um, just neutralize that, um, which would otherwise be a disincentive for that more cost efficient system. So in my mind, I do think that it is um, an important part of the overall picture, but I love where you're going also with um, starting with those riders and thinking about the overall goals and the performance. Um, I think that's really right on. Right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I would hesitate obviously to ever tell a commission or any you know, policy making body, please you do. have to do everyone, something. Hey, everyone else does. So you're, you're, please do. <laughs> I should just, I should just, <laughs> just do it. All right. Um, but since you asked, um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it, it, it could be, you know, a, a failure of imagination to say there's no other way to do it. Like, you, sure, if you, if you really said, you know, we're absolutely not going to go down that path. We're not doing lost revenue. We're not doing decoupling. Could you still incent? Whatever those objectives might be, system efficiency, safety, reliability, customer sad, efficiency, whatever it might be, yeah, you probably could. It'd be a lot harder. I mean, I think, I think particularly when you're talking about incenting demand side and customer empowerment, things like that, look, the, the, the overall context, and this is not new to anybody, but I think it's, it's, it's worth saying, you know, you had a, a, a system that was designed for ever-increasing growth of electric demand, right? I mean, the, the model that Sam Insel brought to the Illinois legislature in 1907 or whatever it was, was, you know, contemplated an ever-increasing, you know, increase, you know, ever-increasing um, upward trajectory of, of demand. And through the 50s and 60s and 70s, that was pretty true, right? Six, eight, ten percent demand growth every decade. In the 80s, it started to go down to three or four percent by 
the aughts, it was down to one or two. You know, EIA now says 0.6% load growth year over year between now and 2040. And by the way, they have overpredicted every single year for the last 15 years. When you look out for their projections 10 years, they always overpredict. So if they're overpredicting on 0.6%, demand's going to be flat. And then if the, the objective is empower your customers to use less, now you're telling utilities to sell less. I don't see how you do it without some kind of a mechanism for decoupling or lost revenue adjustment. Again, you could probably do it. It'd be a lot harder. I think it's pretty foundational. Okay. And then I see as some low-hanging fruit the – We've got to think about the mechanism to do it, but I, I see as low-hanging fruit the the address. I'll say addressing the cloud computing issue, mm -hmm. as well as the as as well as maybe protocol for potential non-wires alternatives mm -hmm. um, for distribution utilities. So again, it's partial observation, partial question, but hopefully it'll help frame some dialogue up here. Any questions from the body up here? Yes. This is a really good panel. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't really have a question, but I just have some takeaways that I feel like are really important that you all brought to the table. And um, like, for instance, Doug, you said that um, innovation is needed most in energy efficiency. I'm really thinking about that. So how do you think en energy efficiency is? How, what kind of innovation? All the things you mentioned, or um, is there one particular standout? Yeah. Uh, there, there's a few. Um, I, I'll mention a few. I think um, one um, would be really bringing um, time and location value to energy efficiency. So Chairman just mentioned non-wires alternatives. Can we really start to understand and, and evolve the programs to a point where you could actually look at a particular you know, feeder, circuit, set of feeders, whatever it might be, and really target um, solutions there? And I think that's going to become even more important as, you know, uh, a lot of the, the, the data shows that the number one predictor of electric vehicle ownership, anybody want to guess what it is? It's whether or not your neighbors have an electric vehicle. <laughs> this is like, you know, humans, we're, we're, we're pack animals. Like if somebody does something, we want to do it. And so you end up getting a whole bunch of chargers in one area. And now do you need to make the decision to then put a whole bunch of new infrastructure in, which, by the way, isn't going just to that neighborhood. It's going to the whole service territory. Or can you target demand-side management like managed charging? Everybody plugs in at 530 when they get home, but the car doesn't charge until midnight. So that is a form of energy efficiency. But of course, you know things like thermostats and connected lights and smart plugs, all those things can do that and manage the demand side. So that's a clear area of innovation. I would also call out there's a lot of innovation happening in the low-income space. And I think that is one that really should, you know, when you're thinking of your objectives, is how do we really make sure in this energy, you know, transformation and, and, and everything going on that, that um, low-income customers have, have a place in that, that, that they have access to programs and technologies and services as well. Um, and so I see a lot of innovation happening in that space um, from, from our company, from the industry in general. Um, so you can, you can tell I go on a long time. But I'll, I'll throw those couple okay. out. And, and okay. Great. Um, Sonia, I just want to say thanks for the frame. You guys frame the issue so nicely as far as like really teeing up the fact about the information asymmetry and that setting clear goals is really important. So I appreciate that. And I've written that down a couple times. And then Ryan, you're talking about the changing utility model from the cost of service to some other options. And so I really want to thank you all because I think you provided a lot of really good information for us to like really think about and you know, springboard off of for our, our, our next phase or a report that's going to come out of this. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Others? Christina. I'm just curious. I know a few folks have talked about basis point adders to either incent or disincent certain goals. And I know some of these are fairly new, but have there been any trends in terms of actual performance from utilities either achieving the goals or not, um, just kind of where they have been implemented? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think, well, that's a great question. Um, and uh, we like to joke it's about the performance of performance-based regulation, and we're getting really meta now. But um, <laughs> so uh, I think 
one area um, where we have seen some uh, results um, is with the UK model. Um, and it's interesting. Um, I was actually just over at Offgem talking to them about the performance of their uh, program. And um, they really seem to believe internally, at least at the, um, at the regulatory body there, um, that defining those goals clearly and defining the metrics has actually changed utilities management's attention on those particular issues. So that, I think, is, you know, on first principles, a really great outcome. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times you'll see um, that that utilities perform really well against these metrics and performance targets. Um, and y you have to kind of ask yourself, you know, is that a function of those utilities performing extremely well? Or is it because there's perhaps a bias in the sort of um, whole process of coming up with those targets toward being a little bit on the conservative side? Um, so, it's it's you know it's kind of hard to tell it, it it where you set your target on the the metrics um, is also very uh, interrelated to that question that um, you guys were asking earlier around how big should the um, revenue or the uh, adjustment on ROE uh, actually be um, associated with performance because you know if you're setting a more aggressive performance target perhaps it makes sense to allow for a greater you know incentive to be attached to that. Or if it's, you know, going to be something that the utility has done pretty well performing on for a while, maybe you don't need as big of an incentive. Um, so I, I think on the whole, where we've seen performance uh, targets being set and um, utilities being measured, they've done quite well. Um, but then there's some unpacking to do on, on why that might be. <laughs> Others? Oh, just a quick question, kind of about the... Oh, terrible with this. Okay. This is for Ryan and the contracts and the prepays and the cloud services. The amortization period on those, are those typically aligned with the contract itself, or is it more like, you know, a tax code depreciation? I was just trying to get a sense of what, uh, what amortization periods are being used. Danny can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we amortize them over the length of the contract okay. in our modeling. All right. Um, The last method. Danny, that, don't kill me. You got to go to the. There's, there's, <laughs> we joke there's millions watching at home, but there's probably some people watching. At home. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I believe it, my it, wife is watching. Thank so, you. Then, yeah. In our. Um, <laughs> in, in the final method that we came up with, the pay as you go, that was meant to provide some rate based earnings um, and allow you to not have to prepay and retain that flexibility. Um, because we had to line up the, con we tried to line up the contract end date and the amortization mm -hmm. um, to s keep with common practice, but it didn't provide the same rate-based earnings. And so that's why we added a shared savings mechanism so that it would um, make up the gap. Um, because it's a regulatory asset though, commissions do have authority to um, amortize different, uh, over a period that's different from the end date of a contract or the useful life. Uh, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Others? Dan? Uh, thank you. In, in this space of performance-based rate making, the question that comes to mind for me first or, or second, unfortunately, is where does it go off the rails? What are the riskiest mechanisms out there that we should stay away from or if we pursue any of these mechanisms, particularly in the, the shared savings uh, um, aspect, uh, which ones have led to either ineffective or adverse outcomes where the, the goals may be well, well intended and um, high minded and, um, but the outcomes end up not, not achieving uh, anything that's um, it results that are not consistent with the goals. So what should we look out for? What should we not do? I can offer something. Um, well, one of them is just about choosing metrics carefully. Um, so if you have the sort of overall goals um, and then uh, and then you 
For example, let me just be specific, and I think that actually this came up as a reference earlier. Um, uh, there was a customer service metric in California a while back um, that uh, was tied to how quickly customer calls were resolved um, or how, um, how fast they were answered, um, and there were just ways that the utility was able to game those metrics um, and not actually provide the higher level of customer service that they were actually intended to incentivize and instead kind of, um, you know, really uh, miss the mark but still earn the incentive. So that's one. I would, I would also add that you shouldn't have too many metrics at the same time, right? Keep it to a manageable number. Um, they could be working at cross purposes potentially. Um, it just or just be hard to manage. So you know, it's the, it's the kind of thing that you can that you can build incrementally. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, you know, there's been some references to the UK Rio model. That was a pretty significant sort of reinvention of the regulatory framework uh, that took years and was applied to an entire country. So uh, I think you can do this incrementally. You can see what works. Uh, there was also some comments made about making sure that the that the um, the the targets and the rewards are commensurate. So you want to make sure that you're not reaching too far and not giving enough reward for the risk that would be involved in trying to reach the target. At the same time, you also don't want to um, reward the utility for something that it's already doing. So getting that balance right, um, you know, part it might be partly trial and error, and it might be starting small, but then. Know, building on your experience. Yeah, I think I think the RAP report is either in the, the, the one for this or another report I've, I've read by RAP has a bunch of examples of things to look out for. I remember reading one about there was a safety metric, I think it was California and yeah and so it was an NREL report. Okay, all right, so I'm sure they can provide that to you to, to put in put in the record as well. But, um, you know, there was a, a safety one as one example, and so a utility wasn't reporting accidents because they wanted to, you know, like, so yes, I mean, I, I think it's a great question. Like, obviously, you have to think through all those and make sure that you're setting it the right way. And I, and I also think it would be a fallacy to think that you would like set up a system and then like okay now we have performance based rate making we're done right i mean it's it's always going to evolve and change i think the example of the rio model right i mean they're they're going through some changes there of some of the metrics and, and making sure the, the the overall i think structure and foundation has to be sound and then with this to make sure that investors and shareholders and analysts and all that don't think that the system is constantly being turned upside down, which makes obviously investors uh, afraid. But at the same time, there can be some change in those to make sure that the objectives are actually being hit. Yeah. I think that NREL report does a good job with some of the good murals there. Any others? Okay. Please thank our panelists. Thank you. Wonderful job this morning, um, really educational. Thank you very much to all of our speakers this morning. We are going to adjourn from power forward actually until 1.45. Uh, the commission has its weekly commission meeting between 1.30 and 1.45 where we will um, decide on whether we're going to approve certain orders and entries. So we will readjourn power forward 1.45. Thank you.